my name is Shaw Rawat. Uh, I'm from uh, the True Data Science team. I'm a senior data scientist there. And this is joint work then uh, with uh, my fellow uh, data scientists, uh, Abhinav, Joseph, and Shiram. Uh, so how many of you here are familiar with Trulia? Oh, a good number. Uh, that's great. Uh, and how many of you are actually searching for homes these days? <laughs> OK. OK. So. Uh, so uh, the the crux, crux of this talk it would be about like uh, uh, would be able to use computer vision uh, and specifically deep learning, and also uh, understanding uh, the text that we have for properties that you see on the website, and sort of somehow combine both of the, these two information and sort of create a, uh, an interface that can provide users with collections of photos. So let's say seller photos or uh, swimming pool photos across all the Trulia active for sale collection. So, uh, so Trulia, so uh, I'll begin with some introduction about Trulia. So Trulia is a, a real estate search site. You go there, you, uh, you can search for homes that are for sale. And uh, it, not only require, uh, it not only provides you within, uh, with a way of interacting with uh, the properties that are active or for sale currently, but also an interface between you and your agents. And, uh, and also it uh, actually captures a lot of uh, data around uh, the real estate. So uh, there are some uh, really great visualizations that we have by extracting data uh, from various sources like wildlife fire thread or earthquake threats and like crime threats. Uh, so, uh, so Trulia has, uh, like, we have recently uh, been acquired by Zillow. And what it does is it provides us, uh, it makes us one of the largest brands across, uh, across US. Uh, with the, uh, the largest inventory of real estate content. Uh, and it, it also composes uh, pretty much the biggest uh, chunk of uh, unique visitors that uh, come to uh, real estate websites. So, uh, OK, so the major problem here is that we have a lot of unstructured data, uh, like uh, all, all, of, all of the web. And then there are a lot of images that needs organization so that people can come and find what they're interested in. So if somebody is interested in, let's say, oh, I'm interested in a bathroom which has a fireplace uh, and pink walls, or something like that. Uh, so those are interesting queries, and uh, we m might want to support that. Uh, so looking at what data we have at Trulia in terms of images, it's not uh, large, it's not, but it's pretty modest. Uh, we get around 20,000 to 25,000 new properties uh, added to our collection every day. Uh, and then uh, this amounts to like 72,000 uh, properties as a whole over a month. And this amounts to like 9 million photos. Uh, at any given time, we have around 2 million active for sale properties. Uh, and uh, by, look at, by looking at that and around 10 photos per, uh, per property, we have like 20 million active photos. So there's a good amount of photos that we have at any given time that is we can display to users uh, and sort of create those photo collections that people can look at. Uh, so one thing to note here is that uh, the photos, as soon as the property goes out of market, we basically pull down that image. So that is no more uh, part of the collection. So these photo collections would stay as long as the property is active. So they are always sort of uh, new data coming in. So there is uh, uh, in a stream. So. Uh, so real estate photos, so basically, if you have homes, then like every time, uh, so the way the, the real estate industry works is basically uh, uh, the, somebody who wants to sell his house submits a listing, the listings via MLSs comes to us, and then we put it on the website. Uh, and then uh, uh, the two important things that uh, you would basically see with a, with a particular pro a property would be the images and a textual description about that property, where it is located. Uh, sort of well, what are the key attributes in that house, that whether it has a fireplace or not, uh, whether it has granite countertops, uh, what type of pool it has, and so on. Uh, and so as you can see, there are like two uh, sets, uh, two types of unstructured data here. One is the images that uh, you don't know anything about. Uh, these images don't come with any captions. Uh, they don't come with any manual tags. They do, even their names is like a, a hash code. So, so basically, there's no information about the image at all. Uh, most of the conventional search engines or image search engines rely heavily on the text attributes that come or text metadata that comes with these images, right? Uh, so if you go to Google Image Search, the major results that you see at the top are not from a computer vision system, but they are actually uh, highly boosted by, by the textual attributes that are, uh, come with the image. Uh, 
Uh, and then we have the other unstructured set of data, which is the text itself, uh, uh, which uh, primarily com comprises of uh, descriptions that users have or, or the property owners have provided with that property. Uh, uh, so what we want to do is we want uh, our user, our Trulia customers, to be able to sort of take this large collection of 2 million uh, properties and uh, 20 million photos and then sort of form uh, a browsable sort of photo collection for them. Oh, for example, like crystal chandeliers in dining room photos, right? Uh, so here are some of the examples that, uh, some of the collections that we have made uh, using our, uh, uh, our data, like, like seller, seller photos, uh, like something like center island kitchen. So not only are we looking at kitchens, but we are looking at specifically kitchens that are actually a center island. Uh, <clears throat> You can see, also see the captions that is extracted sort of to suggest like what part of the description is uh, referring uh, to the, uh, the center island. Uh, in many cases, like you will find that there is, uh, uh, in some cases, in some of these photos, it is pretty clear that there's a center island, but in many cases, the center island is sort of obscured in terms of the last photo, uh, where it's not very clear like, whether it's a center island or not. <coughs> so things like crystal chandelier. So, uh, so crystal chandeliers, uh, uh, in dining room photos, uh, we can have uh, similarly like architecture styles. So we want to look at homes that have that are Mediterranean style. Uh, we want to look at photos of pool, which are like infinity pools, uh, and so on. So how do you go about creating such a collection? Uh, so there are m multiple ways. One way is like you can use user generated content, right? Uh, most of the current websites, if you look at uh, like Zillow Digs, House, Shutterstock, and Pinterest. Most of these websites actually run by uh, users uploading photos and then providing enough metadata that actually allows them to sort of organize this content. And this, this is pretty powerful, and you actually can get really good quality photos. Uh, you can get really good organization of content and make the browser experience really good. Uh, but there is a downside of this as well. Like, because like, if you see, uh, most, since these are uploaded by users, these are tagged by users, the process itself is pretty slow. Right, and so there's a slow growth of content or inventory that you uh, that you would gradually stack up. And the other problem is it's sort of expensive. So let's say you are doing uh, crowdsourcing, sort of you're saying, oh, okay, not only users uh, tag my data, but maybe I can crowdsource it to Amazon Mechanical Turk, or maybe I do it Crowdflower, whatever. And it's it's expensive because you probably have to pay more uh, to have fine-grained uh, uh, tagging of the images. Uh, and then content gets stale. So even though I have like, oh, maybe I have like 100, 200 new photos being uploaded by users every day, or like more than that uh, for in some cases, the, the, the content uh, would actually become stale after a while because uh, there's not much activity happening there. Uh, and so you'll be showing the same swimming pool photos all over again. Uh, so there's some of the uh, limitations with, uh, like, so why we can't do it? Because we can't do it because, as I said, like most of our data is just coming from the listings, MLSs. There's no content in those. And what we have to do is we cannot rely on a user-generated content here. We have to either do crowdsourcing or find some other way of organizing that collection through computer vision or uh, textual mining. So uh, the other way is, uh, okay, so we know deep learning is really uh, uh, getting a move on. Uh, it's sort of uh, fueling our industry in terms of uh, breaking many benchmarks. And uh, so why can't we use that? And yes, we can, actually. It, uh, so if you use uh, the current, uh, current like convolution networks, current state-of-the-art convolution networks, you can do pretty well in terms of recognizing scenes, recognizing uh, objects. Uh, but the, what about attribute recognition? Like, so like, let's say we have a scene, and then obviously identifying a kitchen is easy, but then identifying finer grain information within that kitchen, for example, granite countertops, what if, is it a large bedroom or is it a small bedroom, uh, what is the texture uh, of, of the countertop itself, given that the image has been taken from a cer certain perspective where the, the texture is not at all visible. Uh, texture is actually a very big problem specifically because texture gets affected, like it's really a fine attribute of any surface, and then it really gets affected a lot by the perspective at which you are viewing it, the lightness, the brightness, and so um, a hardwood floor can look a concrete floor uh, given to a machine learning algorithm given certain uh, uh, considerations. So, uh, and then there is a problem of occlusion, absence, or recognizing brand. So for example, uh, what if I want to say, oh, show me all bathrooms that have Kohler fixtures, right? Uh, okay, so I need to first locate that there is a fixture there, and then how do I identify the brand? Right, uh, that's a tricky, uh, tricky uh, computer vision problem. Uh, 
uh, occlusion. So the center island is somehow occluded uh, from the way the user took the picture of, of the kitchen, right? Uh, because we don't control how the picture is taken. And then there is abs absence. So uh, it could be either occluded or it could be absent at all, right? So there is no, uh, in that picture of the kitchen, there is no uh, uh, center island. So, uh, so that's why we cannot uh, like completely do computer vision here. And then uh, we obviously, like, if we do so, like for a new domain, like let's say real estate, or let's say a new domain, like you are do reading the web where you have these uh, HTML pages of images and text, right? Uh, cre creating all these training samples for each of your attributes or each of your uh, objects and classes would require a lot of training data. So domain adaptation will become really hard if you are doing it completely via computer vision. Uh, so, as I said, like there are a lot of challenges. You have illumination, you have rotation, uh, you have scale variance, uh, viewpoint variations, occlusions, and scene clutter. With, especially with scenes, there's a lot of clutter happening in the uh, in the scenes. And so, uh, how do you differentiate between uh, a so uh, like a, a, a particular room which has a bed, but then it also has a, a sofa, and then it also has a chair, uh, and there's a lot of things that each signal to it being a different scene type. Uh, and then there's a lot of intra-class variations as well. Uh, so, okay, so uh, the base data that we have uh, to begin with is images, and then you have the textual content. And what we want to do here is that uh, we know how to do well on identifying scenes at the higher level. Uh, at, at the textual level, we know uh, how to extract uh, interesting key phrases or contents from the text. And then we want to do is transfer knowledge from what we understand from the property descriptions over to what we understand of the scene. So for example, if I know that granite countertops is associated with kitchens, and then I'm able to find in that big collection of photos per property that uh, there is a kitchen, then I can assign those attributes over to that, uh, that photo. And by sort of tuning the way I score each of those photos, I can actually create a retrieval system that can f sort of, given a query, given a key phrase, return me an ordered list of images that match that query. So that's uh, sort of the gist of the uh, simple idea. You take, uh, you understand uh, the associations between the scene and your key phrases, and then transfer that information from the property descriptions to uh, the visual modality that you have detected. So this allows you to actually not uh, train like thousands of models or 2,000 models of all the possible key phrases that might are interesting in your domain, but just train all the one, the few models that you think would perform really well and then use uh, the semantic model based on the text to transfer that information over to the visual model. So for example, again, it's an example of uh, you have a kitchen here, but then you have so many attributes uh, that are either occluded or uh, the perceptions is difficult to uh, gauge. Like, so you have bay windows, eating kitchen, you have island kitchen, hardwood flooring, white kitchen cabinets, research lighting. All of them mentioned in, in, the, in the description, but uh, training an individual classifier for each one of them would be expensive. So as I said, the key idea, build a visual model uh, to recognize major scene uh, environments. Uh, we can use deep convolution networks. We can use also traditional bag of words models. Uh, we can use, uh, then uh, use the text that we have to build a semantic model of how things are organized in a house based on how people describe it, uh, which we'll use word embeddings for it. And then we basically do a knowledge transfer. So we transfer information from the, uh, the textual model over to the visual model and this sort of falls into a category of zero-shot learning, where we don't, my visual model doesn't know anything about granite countertops or hardwood flooring, but I infer that information from my textual model. Uh, so I hope there's 30 minutes left. So next 30 minutes, uh, I will be talking about uh, high level about deep learning. I think uh, the crowd is, uh, already knows much about it. Uh, then I'll talk about how we build our visual model, uh, the textual model, uh, and uh, then how we do the transfer. So. <coughs> and then we'll follow it up with the Q&A. So, uh, so deep learning uh, has been around for a while um, and really sort of took off in the last uh, four, three to four years. And it's finally here, like you see a lot of applications, uh, real world applications where it's being applied. Um, and uh, if to quote Wikipedia, the deep learning is a set of algorithms in machine learning that tries to model high level abstractions. Uh, and what it, how it does that is via through multiple layers of nonlinear transformations of data. So, uh, so you take some input, do some nonlinear transformations, and then uh, at the end you have 
uh, uh, representation, uh, whatever, a classification or regression, whatever you want. Uh, so often, like, uh, so I was looking at a particular uh, talk by Andrew Ng, like, uh, a few, few days back, uh, that was in the CUDA conference, I, I presume, and uh, he was talking about, like, there is a lot of hype about deep learning, and then deep learning is because it mimics the brain, and then he was, uh, he quoted uh, Michael Jordan, and which said that, uh, it's just a cartoon of, of how the brain works. We don't know nothing about how the brain works. So uh, uh, the hype is there, but uh, the, uh, it, it's not exactly how your brain works. It's, uh, it's still far away. Uh, okay, so what do we mean by high-level uh, intermediate representations? Uh, so, for example, like for example, in face recognition, you would say, okay, take the image, take take the raw pixels, take the uh, uh, the raw pixel values, and sort of learn these higher levels. At each level, for example, layer one, if you see, is pretty uh, known to uh, computer vision scientists as like, okay, GABA filters or like edges and corners. And the second layer is basically a combination of these. So if you take these uh, multiple layers and sort of combine them, you can think you can create all those uh, parts, the face parts. And then if you combine those, then you can reconstruct a face. Uh, so these are the higher level abstractions that deep learning is able to uh, learn. Uh, similarly for speech recognition, and I think speech recognition is uh, is one of the areas which actually sort of sustained deep learning or like were the first uh, places where deep learning really performed well. And there the first, uh, the idea is to take the raw speech signal and then to sort of identify uh, uh, latent representations that can uh, do very good at phoneme classification. Uh, so, uh, uh, so what is a neural network? To, uh, to, to quote Benchio, like he terms it as like, um, like running several logistic regressions at once, right? So if you see uh, basically in this particular network, like each neuron, basically each node that we see there is connected to all the, uh, the nodes in the previous layer, so it's a fully connected architecture. And so what it means is like every node is basically a WTX, where X is the input to it and a transformation by that. So it's like a linear classifier, right? So each neuron is a, like a linear classifier and then apply the sigmoid on top of it, you have a logistic regression. So in a way you can say it like, like multiple logistic regressions happening at once. Uh, the key advantage of deep learning is like uh, we have end-to-end -end learning. So you have this continuous differentiable function that you can optimize for uh, instead of doing uh, part-based learning. Uh, so deep learning is now state-of-the-art across various bench benchmarks, be it NLP, uh, images and speech recognition. Um, a lot of recent work has uh, gained popularity around captioning, which is sort of work that sort of relates to this talk in terms of uh, taking images and then sort of uh, generating captions for them automatically. Uh, uh, this is another slide uh, from some time back where like the effect of deep learning on speech recognition is shown uh, to make a significant impact uh, compared to the last decade of research. <coughs> So now, so coming to how to build uh, the visual model. Uh, so we'll talk. Uh, so how many of you here uh, have worked with computer vision in your earlier life? Uh, two. Uh, okay. And uh, have you worked with bag of words model? So yeah. So it seems like uh, uh, years are like uh, like history. But uh, uh, bag of words model has been uh, has been the area of research for the last. 10 years uh, of computer vision before com convolution networks came in, and now you hardly see them in any conference. Uh, so uh, this is how the image recognition pipeline used to work before. You had these images, and you used to perform feature extraction, in, uh, you would encode them, and then you do the prediction, right? Uh, so you have these standard features that you would extract. You would extract SIF, DAISY, HOG, JIS, uh, and then you have encoding, so you have uh, the bag of words, just like, uh, we call it bag of visual word, just like bag of word. You have uh, Fisher, Fisher vectors, uh, GSV, uh, and then you have spatial pyramids and all of those. Uh, and then at the end, once you have these representations, then you use a, a linear classifier or a kernel SVM uh, to do the classification. And now it looks much different. It's like instead of having all these different subparts, we have end-to-end uh, -end learning with a convolution network. So this is a, a, a like this is a snapshot from the Krzyzewski et al. Uh, the first real uh, deep convolution network that broke the benchmarks uh, in ImageNet uh, 2012, I think. Um, okay, so I, I would go with uh, sort of a brief description of bag of words model so that we understand uh, what they do and then why is deep learning doing much better on top of that. So uh, each image, the way computer sees it as, is like, is basically pixels, right? And pixels have a value from zero to 256 across three channels, RGB. Uh, 
And so the way the initial uh, scientists sort of uh, sorted it out, was like, okay, so what we can do is we take the image and then we break it into like these patches. So each image is composed of several patches, right? And then we, if we were able to represent each patch, then we'll probably be able to represent the whole image as a distribution over these patches. And so this is, uh, this is how it used to be, just like bag of words. You basically take all these patches, represent these patches, and then create a code book, and then define, uh, represent each image as a distribution over those patches. Uh, to go more deep, it would be like this. So you take an exterior of the house photo, you sort of extract these, uh, let's say, four by four uh, patches, and then represent them by one of the feature, features that we described. Uh, uh, mostly, these features are basically gradients uh, to capture how uh, edges look, how edges or corners look. And, uh, as we, uh, uh, and then you take these, uh, a bunch of these, and then learn a code book. So unlike words, where each word in itself is its own cluster, mostly its own cluster, uh, here the each each word is basically a vector. So you probably have to do quantization or uh, clustering, something like k-means or gmm. Uh, and then once you have that, you do an encoding, any of the Fisher encoding or uh, k-means based encoding. Uh, and then uh, you have a representation, and then you do a some sort of nonlinear transform, usually a Hellinger kernel, and then you have apply a linear classifier to do one versus all classification. Um, so there are certain drawbacks, as we can see. Uh, some, uh, well, the spatial and color informations are not captured effectively. Uh, we have to sort of enforce them via encoding representations. So you'll probably do uh, spa uh, spatial bag of words, or you'll probably do uh, train a different color-based feature extractor and a, a, a gradient-based feature extractor and then sort of fuse them either in early or late fusion. Uh, and so there are a lot of handcrafted features which have taken like decades of research. Uh, and then there's multi-part learning, which is I think the major, major bottleneck. Each of these components are optimized individually and not as, as an end-to-end -end system. Uh, come uh, convolutional networks. Uh, they try to solve this problem with an end-to-end -end learning, a single differential differentiable function across. And uh, it has like uh, uh, three important parts. One is the convolution. Convolution, you can think of convolution as sort of uh, uh, similar going back to how computer vision was done. Like you take a, a, a bigger patch and then sort of, ex sort of represent it, right? So convolution does that. It takes a, it takes a patch and sort of represents it. Uh, and then it, it, it convolves or basically applies that sort of patch filtering or across the whole image multiple times. So you have these different kernel maps that you're creating there. Uh, it has non-linearity. So the non-linearity is important because if you're stacking multiple layers, you probably want to do a non-linearity at each layer so that you actually end up learning a non-linear function rather than a linear function at the end. So, uh, so you usually use rectifier linear units or sigmoid. Uh, and then you have pooling. Pooling basically tries to sort of say, uh, okay, now that I've convolved several regions together, I want to have some sort of invariance in my uh, in my learned representations. Uh, pooling sort of does that through, like, by aggregating the neighborhood uh, activations. Uh, so here's like a simple uh, explanation of how you take a 14 by 14 uh, pixel space and then sort of convolve it down by applying uh, with a stride of one to 10 cross 10, do pooling, where you are basically taking two cross two uh, nearby uh, patches and then you know, combine them into one. Uh, usually use max pooling and then doing the process over and over again. <coughs> so, uh, uh, so this is, this is the LX, LXNet, uh, and that sort of takes that step further. You have now seven layers, uh, several layers of uh, convolution and max pooling. And at the end, there is the typical uh, fully connected uh, neural network and a, sig uh, and a sigma softmax uh, classifier. Um, and, and as for the training, it's, pretty, uh, it's a pretty standard algorithm that we see uh, over and over again in all the deep learning models. Uh, that's the real power of deep learning is like you have the same uh, learning algorithm that can apply to any problem, any domain. Uh, and so sample data, do a forward pass to get predictions, backpropagate the errors, update the weights, uh, and uh, repeat until uh, you have, uh, until you are satisfied with the results. Uh, uh, just to give a comparison uh, across the two models, like this is the LXNet. It has, uh, it was trained on 1.2 million images. It has around 16 million parameters, basically the connections that are happening across the network, uh, and it classifies a thousand classes, and it's seven layers deep. Uh, a bag of words model that we train uh, has around 0.4 million parameters. So this definitely, like in terms of the number of parameters itself, it's like much more representative of the domain. <coughs> 
Uh, a brief history, uh, the uh, conversion networks have been around for a while. Um, Fukushima, um, Hinton, and then Lee Kun, the famous uh, sort of uh, uh, MNIST data, which has been one of the benchmarks for any computer vision algorithm. Uh, uh, there was the first time Lee Kun uh, applied a convolution network and sh uh, showed groundbreaking results. And this was followed up much many years later uh, by the work uh, of uh, Chris Wesky and uh, Hinton with LXNet that broke the image and competition. So uh, it, it's worthwhile to sort of mention ImageNet because uh, uh, it, I think this is the, the data collection that really made the difference in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, really boosting uh, deep learning in computer vision. So uh, I'd say like there's a good amount of images that are required to train uh, such big networks of around 60 million parameters. Uh, and, and again, a sort of a reference of how things have changed. 2010, you used a standard bag of words pipeline, and come 2010, everything has changed. Uh, significant improvements uh, across domain. Um, so the VGG network here is actually 16 to 19 layers deep uh, compared to the seven layers deep two years, uh, two, two years back. Uh, Google Net is a much uh, more complex network, but it uh, has less number of parameters and actually performs uh, bet slightly better than the VGG in the ImageNet 2014 competition. So this is just a comparison. Like we were at like 26 using Fisher vectors and multiple fusion. Uh, 2012, uh, six, uh, Kuzerski uh, at all, we had 16.4. Uh, uh, soon after uh, the uh, uh, Zila and Fergus, who, who now had uh, Clarify. Uh, get around 11%, and um, uh, last year we had uh, the VGG and the Google Net uh, perform 6%. I think this is going down even further to like 4 to 5%. Uh, so uh, what are the different layers learning? So basically what, le uh, given a property of the house, all these layers are sort of learning higher and higher level features, uh, edges, uh, sort of combination of those edges, and then uh, sort of the object representation itself. Uh, uh, and then followed by a train limit classifiers. Uh, again, some uh, work from the winning uh, submission of uh, Zilla et al. during 2013, where they actually visualized uh, all these different layers uh, in their network, uh, which is pretty astonishing what each neuron is learning. So uh, the way, just to clarify how this uh, uh, neurons are basically learned, it's basically saying that this particular neuron is most activated given this average photo. So. Uh, what is causing the activation in this particular neuron. Uh, um, okay, so for this experiment, we have uh, around 40 scene object classes, uh, which we think are sort of uh, occur significantly in our data uh, to be uh, not like uh, clearly uh, identified by a computer vision system. Uh, we use two set of models. We use the bag of words model, uh, the, the ones, uh, especially Fisher vectors. Uh, and then we also use a, a pre-trained convolution network uh, from ImageNet, uh, and then extract layer six and layer seven uh, from it, and then learn uh, an L2SVM, one versus all, uh, via mini batch SGD uh, uh, implementation. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, okay, so that was about the visual model. I'll quickly come into the semantic model. Uh, so, so one of the things that we have to see in terms of uh, uh, semantic model is first we need to know what are the things we need to tag, right? What are the phrases that are interesting for us to be able to identify automatically from a collection that we can then assign to the images, right? Uh, the, our data is noisy, so it's like user-generated sort of typed data, and so it can have spelling errors, abbreviations, and synonyms, so you can have appliances as APPLS, but also as appliances, uh, and so on. Uh, you can have BICC, or built-in China cabinets, and so you need to be understand how these things are related so that you can do a much better job at assigning these tokens. And then what about multiple phrases, uh, collocations? Uh, so we, uh, first I'll sort of say what, what makes a real estate, uh, what makes a phrase a real estate phrase? And then we use a, a very simple model that was proposed by uh, Hearst and Toma Yuko in around 2003, which basically takes two measurements for uh, defining uh, sort of a domain uh, phraseness, or like the, f uh, the domainness of a phrase, to say. Or, in this case, a real estateness. Uh, so one is a phraseness, which is like how uh, commonly in this particular domain does this phrase or this uh, stream of uh, or a sequence of tokens co-occur, 
right? And then second is informativeness, which says that given this domain, how does this particular phrase is unique to this domain compared to some background domain? So uh, to do so, uh, we use a Wikipedia. So we have Wikipedia English text, which sort of represents uh, the general English. And then we have the Trulia description, which sort of explains what are the interesting phrases in our domain. And then we basically build an n-gram uh, language model uh, to compare the two. Uh, what we use here is uh, uh, a KL divergence. KL divergence basically sort of uh, tells how two distributions are different from each other. Uh, and uh, for phraseness, we simply do uh, the language model foreground and n-gram. So basically, if you have a, a two gram, uh, you're looking at two, uh, uh, two word phrases, then you would actually look at, you'll train a bigram model on your foreground corpus, that is a truly corpus, and then uh, and a foreground corpus, uh, and, and, and a unigram model in the foreground corpus. So if, if it is highly likely that you have a higher probability of this sequence of words um, in an n-gram, then in a unigram, then probably this is a good phrase, right? This occurs quite a lot. In formativeness, it's computed the other way around, where you basically compare the, the foreground model uh, with the background model. So you say, OK, how common is this particular phrase in my Trulia corpus compared to how, com uh, how, how I get it uh, in terms of the background corpus? So this gives a good uh, sort of, um, uh, gives two uh, faces of the coin, like the phraseness, which sort of tells whether it's a phrase or not, and the informativeness, which tells whether it's interesting to my domain or not. And then we sort of combine them. It could be a weighted combination uh, uh, or not. Uh, so these are some of the words that we learn automatically from our data. So when running this algorithm on all the uh, property descriptions would find you interesting uh, elements uh, of what's interesting in your domain, like kitchen, bathroom, which is a major scene types, as tunigrams, and then you have these combinations of biograms like hardwood floors and French doors and crown molding, uh, vaulted ceilings, uh, ceramic tiles, and, and so on. And then you have these trigrams like wood burning fireplaces, so, uh, which you would find less uh, commonly in Wikipedia text. Uh, uh, the second concept that you want to sort of uh, leverage here is like the suspicion semantics. So I think the first talk already talked about um, the, the meaning of uh, distribution semantics, that you shall know a word by the company it keeps. Uh, and uh, it's actually pretty important uh, to understanding our content. So uh, the way people describe it is usually is like when they're describing a kitchen, then probably they'll continue to describe the kitchen. So right, they'll probably say kitchen has granite counters and overabundance of cabinet space, breakfast, buy and stainless steel appliances. Right here, we have good in amount of information that there's a certain association between granite countertops and kitchen because they occur, seem to be occurring in the same context. And that's a very good signal, right? In many domains, that might be uh, pretty useful. So uh, we want to exploit that. Uh, so um, one of the common ways of doing that is have a context window uh, and then uh, sort of compute these co-occurrences counts. And uh, for example, like kitchen would co-occur more with island than with fireplace, and bathroom would co-occur more with showers. Uh, and once you have this matrix, then uh, one of the earlier ways of doing things was to take the co-occurrence matrix and then do some uh, uh, projection using SVD or, or latent semantic analysis, and then get a word vector, which performs the way, same way as you would expect a word vec uh, or, or, or a scriptgram model to work. Uh, here we use a scriptgram model, though. Uh, uh, so I think there are a lot of talks that would sort of um, um, talk more about the scriptgram model. Here I will sort of give, give a brief intuition about the scriptgram model in terms of what it's trying to optimize. Assuming that you have, uh, uh, you want to create a training data, which basically says a uh, pair of two words. One is a word you are interested in, and then the other word, which is either in part of the context. So for example, in this scenario, it would be granite countertops and kitchen. It's a, pair, a training sample. And some random, and then your second sample would be, uh, your negative sample would be any random word uh, and put with kitchen. So it'll be like kitchen and comma, let's say lush, uh, Lush, uh, lush yard. Uh, and so what it does is basically it forms these two data sets, D and D dash, uh, and these pairs of W and C. And then it's basically trying to maximize uh, the function where we want vectors, VC and VW. VC is the uh, vector for a word, the context word C, and W is the vector for uh, the word itself. Uh, we want uh, words that occur in the same context to be closer to each other, and words that are, uh, occur randomly to be far away from each other. By enforcing this, we are sort of capturing the contextual information. And it also, it seems that once we learn this model, it also captures certain semantic interpretations. 
So uh, uh, in our training model, we basically use negative sampling in instead of the hierarchical softmax. Uh, we removed rare words, we did some sam uh, used some sampling frequent words, and used a, 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 a window of size 10. So uh, what are they capturing? Uh, one of the things that they are capturing, which we wanted them to capture, was attribute to scene relationships. So we should know that granite counters are more common in kitchens than in uh, living rooms. Uh, near synonyms, so we come to know that waterfront and lakefront are the same thing. Uh, uh, spelling variations, uh, uh, like appliances and so on. Uh, there's a lot of spelling mistakes in our data. Uh, brands, like, so how would we understand brands and how do we understand like relationships like cher cherry cabinetry and silestone countertops. And uh, actually we see in our data that uh, the distance between cherry, cabin cherry and cabinetry is the same as silestone and countertops. <coughs> Okay, so uh, now looking at like, so now what I've done here is basically uh, try to give an intuition of how uh, things are organized. So you have this, so I've uh, picked like, uh, this is like a collection of like 110 words from our collections that sort of signify what we're trying to learn here. Uh, the ones that are marked with green are the major scene types that we want to, uh, which is our visual model. And then everything is basically assigned to that visual model. So if you uh, detect, let's say, uh, spiral stairways, then we know that it's closest to hallway. So if I get a key phrase spiral stairways, then probably I should use a hallway image to assign that tag to. So uh, uh, one of the interesting things that is capturing is like the differentiation between an indoor scene and an outdoor scene. So if you see everything on the top is like uh, the, the one circle is like an outdoor scene, like swimming pools and gazebos and exterior and architecture types. And then everything on the right is sort of indoor uh, representations. It sort of falls into, the, uh, I mean, it naturally, it makes sense because this is how we, people describe, right? They'll describe the indoor scenes and then outdoor scenes in different contexts. Um, just to give an idea, a visual idea, like so you have waterfronts and uh, <coughs> swimming pools, uh, gazebos and decks, or outdoor scenes. Uh, for some, like interestingly, uh, we have a jacuzzi which actually li lies pretty close to both the bathroom as well as to the swimming pool. So you'll find a jacuzzi both in terms of like cl uh, in both environments, right? Uh, another instance was chandelier, where you, chandelier is actually found in hallways, close to hallways, dining rooms, and living rooms. So that means when you are looking for chandeliers, then you should look at these three photos. So. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, this is an architecture type, so like right at the left corner you have these architectures and then you see all the Victorians and the colonials and the storybooks all jumbled together. So uh, let's say I want to create uh, this collection, I can do so easily. Um, uh, I think I've, I'm running out of time here. So uh, real quick, uh, again, like if you want to sort of understand the branch of uh, 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 faucets, uh, you can actually see there's a cluster like there. Uh, there is cherry cabinetry, uh, granite countertops, and one of the interesting things was balusters. So balusters are basically all those you find in <coughs> stairways, uh, and then we find that balusters are pretty close to, uh, to hallway or, or to stairways. So uh, one can easily, when somebody queries for balusters, we can show them uh, <coughs> stairways. So uh, to summarize, uh, we want to do zero short learning. So learning without examples. We use a visual model to detect the major scenes, and then we use uh, assigned key phrases and the proper descriptions to images using that semantic knowledge that we have. Uh, a few other examples of uh, kitchens with granite countertops, kitchen chandeliers. Uh, yep, that's it, uh, Q&A. So people describe the whole property, they don't describe individual image, and so you have a bunch, a collection of images, and then a text. And you sort of, sort of cherry pick and then assign it, assign it. so it's like. So that process of taking those, those extracted features from the text mm -hmm. and applying them to images, you, is that just automatic, automatically done? Or uh, yes, it, you, it's done using the semantic model that we learned. So that's why, I, uh, so there are two things, that, uh, one thing that I didn't explain here was, uh, one is a semantic model which sort of gives us a global interpretation of how things are related, but then there is also the NLP model which sort of say, takes into account the localization. So if uh, you have granite countertops which is actually uh, referred to as bathrooms with granite countertops, then you won't assign granite countertops to the global model. So you actually have a weighting mechanism. So based on, uh, so weighting mechanism takes into both the local context as well as the global context. 
Uh, yeah, we use a couple of those. Uh, so, uh, so most of our framework is in Python. Uh, one of the things that we use uh, uh, um, is uh, Cafe uh, a lot. Uh, there are a lot of other ones that uh, are out there, Theona, Torch, uh, um, and that are pretty good too. Deep Learning 4J, I think, is good too. Uh, so I think, yeah, there are a lot of open source tools that one can use too. Uh, we also use Gensim for, uh, for the WordVec implementation. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, the algorithm is, so the advantage of these algorithms is that uh, uh, customizations is sort of minimized. Uh, like for example, like the WordVec model, it, it can just take any domain data and push it to it and then it sort of captures. Uh, the good thing is that it sort of fits into the model that we were trying to capture in this particular, this might not apply to every domain, but for us, this is what we wanted to capture. We wanted to capture how things co-occur in the data and WordVec model sort of uh, does that effectively. So uh, that clearly fits a bit. Uh, we had three, uh, yeah, so we had 300 dimensions. Uh, okay, so I think we are almost done. Yeah, so we had 300. Uh, like this. So we, I, I can talk more uh, uh, later. I think I've severely crossed the line. <laughs> <laughs>